Welcome to the Pencil Bob channel. I hope you enjoy my stories. Please like and subscribe and hit that notification icon so you never miss out. Now on with the stories. Moving into our new neighborhood was supposed to be a fresh start, a chance to build a life in a place that felt welcoming and vibrant. We had lived in homeowners associations before, but nothing prepared us for the bizarre experience of living next door to an XHOA president. From the moment we arrived on moving day, the atmosphere felt off. As we pulled into the driveway, I noticed the neighbors watching us from their porches, their expressions inscrutable. No one came over to introduce themselves or even offer a friendly wave. It was as if we had entered a ghost town rather than a community. The silence was palpable, and I felt a knot of unease settle in my stomach. Weeks passed before we finally met the president of the HOA. They approached us with an exaggerated smile showering us with overly enthusiastic compliments about our home. What a lovely place you have. You must be so proud. The words dripped with insincerity, and I couldn't shake the feeling that they were sizing us up rather than genuinely welcoming us. Something about their demeanor felt off, like they were hiding a darker side beneath a veneer of friendliness. Our first real interaction came when we decided to build a fence. We had done our homework, consulting the HOA guidelines and submitting all the necessary documents for approval. After a couple of weeks of waiting, we received the green light from the board. We were relieved and excited to finally have a bit of privacy in our backyard. However, as soon as the construction crew arrived, the president went into full panic mode. Suddenly, they were everywhere, hovering around our property with a look of indignation. They claimed we had violated some obscure rule and threatened us with a cease and desist letter. The audacity was staggering. We had followed all the protocols, yet here they were trying to bully us into submission. The tension escalated quickly. Despite the hostility, we tried to maintain a cordial relationship. I made several attempts to reach out, hoping to mend fences, both literally and figuratively. Each time, I was met with thinly veiled contempt. It was evident that the president had no interest in reconciliation. They were more focused on asserting their dominance. In the months that followed, we began to hear whispers from other neighbors about the president's increasingly erratic behavior. They were notorious for nitpicking every detail of life in the community, handing out fines for the most trivial infractions. I learned that they had once called the police on a four-year-old child who had accidentally wandered onto their lawn while playing. The sheer pettiness of it all was astonishing. The neighborhood grew weary of their antics, and a petition began circulating to have them removed from the board. It was a grassroots effort, fueled by the collective frustration of residents who were tired of living under the thumb of a tyrant. When the votes were tallied, the president was ousted, and new leaders were elected. We hoped this would mark the end of the madness, but the ex-president didn't disappear quietly. They remained in the neighborhood, lurking in the shadows. It was as if they were waiting for the perfect moment to strike back. The community Facebook page, once a hub of communication, was shut down, leaving residents feeling isolated and vulnerable. The ex-president seemed to take pleasure in watching us from their window, a self-appointed guardian of the neighborhood's perceived order. My wife bore the brunt of their aggression. She would often take our dog for walks, and it became a daily ritual for the ex-president to yell at her from their yard. Keep that dog on a leash, they would shout, their voice dripping with disdain. It was infuriating. We were following the rules, yet they acted as if we were the ones breaking them. Things took a darker turn when a large branch fell from a tree during a storm, landing partially on their property and partially on ours. My wife, being the kind-hearted person she is, went to pick up the debris on our side of the line. The ex-president erupted, storming out of their house and screaming at her to leave, there, sticks alone. It was a surreal moment, watching someone so consumed by anger over something so trivial. I felt a mix of anger and helplessness. We had tried to be good neighbors, but it seemed like nothing we did would appease them. Ignoring their antics wasn't enough, they thrived on confrontation. It was exhausting to live in a state of constant vigilance always wary of their next move. As the months dragged on, I began to notice how their behavior affected not just us, but the entire neighborhood. People were hesitant to engage with one another, fearful of being reported for minor infractions. The sense of community that had once felt so vibrant was slowly eroding, replaced by a culture of fear and suspicion. I contemplated reaching out to the new HOA board to discuss the ex-president's ongoing harassment. Perhaps they could issue a warning or even a fine for their behavior. But I hesitated. 
What if that only escalated things? I didn't want to provoke a situation that could turn even uglier. Instead, we began documenting every incident. I started keeping a log of their aggressive behavior, noting dates, times, and specifics of each encounter. It felt like preparing for a battle, and I couldn't shake the feeling that we were living in a war zone. The stress of the situation began to take its toll on my mental health. I found myself constantly on edge, unable to relax in my own home. Friends and family would ask how we were settling in, and I would smile and nod. But inside, I was grappling with the reality of our situation. It was a stark contrast to the life we had envisioned when we moved here. As winter approached, the tension only seemed to mount. The ex-president became more brazen in their harassment, yelling at my wife for the most mundane things. One day, they even confronted her about the color of our front door, claiming it was offensive and detracted from the neighborhood's aesthetic. I couldn't believe the absurdity of it all. I started to feel trapped. The idea of moving was tempting, but we had invested so much into our home. I didn't want to let one person dictate our happiness. Yet, the thought of enduring another year of this torment felt unbearable. In conversations with other neighbors, I learned that we were not alone in our frustrations. Many had experienced similar encounters with the ex-president, and it was clear that they were a source of division in the community. We began to discuss the possibility of taking collective action, but the fear of retaliation loomed large. As the holidays approached, I found myself reflecting on the year. What had started as a hopeful new beginning had devolved into a nightmare. I watched as families decorated their homes for the season, and I felt a pang of jealousy. We had wanted to be part of that joy, but instead, we were consumed by anxiety. Despite the darkness surrounding us, I clung to the hope that change was possible. Perhaps the new HOA board could help restore some semblance of order. But as I watched the ex-president continue their reign of terror, I couldn't shake the feeling that we were in for a long battle. As the year came to a close, I resolved to stand my ground. I wouldn't let this situation define us or our home. We would continue to document their behavior. And I would eventually bring it to the attention of the board. It was time to take a stand, not just for ourselves, but for the entire neighborhood. The ex-president may have thought they could intimidate us into silence, but I was determined to fight back. I just hoped that when the time came, we wouldn't be standing alone. The community had to come together to reclaim the spirit of our neighborhood, and I was ready to do whatever it took to make that happen. As the clock struck midnight on New Year's Eve, I made a silent promise to myself. This year would not be defined by fear or harassment. We would rise above the chaos and work towards a better future, no matter how long it took. The battle was far from over, and I was ready to face whatever challenges lay ahead. As they are escalating their abuse towards your missus, I would suggest documenting the issues and having a report into the HOA about former president seemingly retaliating towards you and your family. If nothing else, it creates a document trail and will be left on community, public record. If you submit the notice at a MTG, which will be fodder for future runs by them at regaining control. Also, once a limb has hit the ground, any movement other than cleanup can be considered littering onto your property. I've had to do this in my HOA. They are not above the law. Also, the rules can be against state and federal laws, like being able to enter the backyard at any time. That's called trespassing. Video and call the cops. They will stop. I did have to go a bit further. This may vary by state, but I reported the management attorney to the State Bar Association about laws and actions in their HOA. This completely deflated the HOA. Include the police report in the complaint and fines help if related. This route requires some sort of law violation or monetary loss that is in violation of state, federal law. This can really hurt the people running HOA if there are numerous violations reported. Mine had both harassment and a bogus fine that was clearly wrong in their writing. Keep doing what you're doing. Anyone willing to call the cops on a kid that stumbles onto a lawn is going to implode soon. By implode, I mean like a heart attack or stroke. The less you bend to them, by continuing to follow the laws, rules, and procedures, and being a normal person, walking your dog on a leash, cleaning up your yard, if I'm understanding that correctly, is probably increasing the amount of stress they perceive. And few things will cause more medical problems than self-imposed anxiety. A board member's rant. Yes, I do sit on an HOA board, but hear me out. 
I joined the board because I sat on the social committee, and our chairperson wanted to move on, and we didn't want the social committee to end because of that. Since then, it has been nothing but hell dealing with these people. Where it started, there were several vacancies on the board due to some community members complaining that the previous board wasn't being transparent and they were taking votes outside of the monthly board meeting and holding secret meetings. Two of those people who were the most vocal about the lack of transparency were elected to the board, along with me and two other people. It's a seven-person board. Almost immediately two people wanted to take votes and get rid of our management company and all this other stuff in a special meetings outside the monthly meeting before we even were officially seated on the board. The gentleman of the two at one meeting actually stood up and demanded a vote to fire the management company in 30 days. This gentleman was previously on the board, but quit after the previous board fired a management company. He lobbied to get hired because they were very bad, so I think his agenda was to get that company back on. Anyway, I called him on the BS. How can you be taking votes outside of the meeting after complaining about that very thing? Of course, that made me be an immediate outcast and put a target on me in the social committee's back. At the first meeting, what they did was tell me that I didn't have an approved budget. I let them know that the budget was approved prior to 2023 by the previous board. I was told that, that it didn't matter this board didn't approve it. Prior to me being in the board, we had a Valentine's Day party at Neighborhood Bar and I was accused of giving people alcohol and said that the whole event put the HOA at risk. This was prior to me becoming a board member. However, the previous social chair said that they talked to the lawyers and the insurance and because we were not providing alcohol, we were fine. This fell on deaf ears, and it still gets brought up every meeting since. At one meeting, they were so concerned that our social events were putting the HOA at risk that they didn't want the HOA's name on any of the flyers of the events the HOA was sponsoring. At the last meeting, I got dinged because I wasn't putting the HOA name on any of the flyers. Next, we were having a Memorial Day pool event. The Wednesday before Memorial Day, they held a special meeting and started telling me that the event was illegal. One of the new members was a paralegal, and she has a lot of experience in law. So she knows, it didn't matter this was like the second time we've had this exact event and we had cleared them before with our legal and our insurance company. After scrambling the whole next couple of days, the lawyer and the insurance company came back and said we told the board that we had sufficient coverage. Two members of the board came to the pool party and sat in the corner and scowled. After they left, the fire department showed up checking capacity. Fire department come out on Memorial Day by just coincidence. I don't know. But it's shady. Also, at the special meeting, they voted to fire the management company and give them 60-day notice. I became very frustrated at that point and voiced my concerns about these special meetings and making decisions outside the board meeting. I kid you not, but one board member said we are the HOA and we can actually do what we want. If needed, we can vote to change the bylaws to allow it. I was told if I didn't like it, I could quit. I told him that yes, I will quit, but not until after the next board meeting so I can tell the neighborhood exactly what's going on in these special meetings and what this board thinks they can do. I was completely upset at that point and walked out of the meeting saying I wasn't going to be any part of this. Apparently, after I left, they made a motion to dismantle the social committee completely. At the next board meeting, they took a vote on that and it didn't pass, but seriously, why wouldn't HOA want to have a social committee? His family after that four members quit. So there's only three of us left. And we already voted to fire the management company, so we have to do the business of finding a new management company with only three. Needless to say, I did not volunteer to do any of that work. We did pick up a two new member who took charge of that. After that, it was somewhat quiet. However, Two of the members admitted to never reading the board packets and didn't show to meetings regarding hiring a new management company. Then just recently they decided to take one of those board members that quit back onto the board. Now I am being asked for a full audit of all my supplies. One board member asked me what have I done with the paper plates I didn't use they are asking for a headcount for all my past events. I didn't take headcount because I didn't know we needed to. I have also been accused of again not having a line-by-line -line budget. However, I've showed them the line-by-line -line budget several times. Accused that I have not been transparent. However, I've turned in every receipt. The receipts are itemized, mind you. This is a $5,000 budget. I'm not going to get rich and live on some island for the rest of my days on that money. I find myself feeling incredibly frustrated and defensive right now. Caught in a whirlwind of accusations that paint me as someone who thrives on conflict and seeks out drama. It's disheartening to be misunderstood in this way especially when all I've ever wanted is to foster a sense of community and connection among my neighbors. Recently, I proposed a new idea for our neighborhood block party, envisioning a lively event filled with food trucks, games for the kids, 
and opportunities for everyone to mingle and strengthen their bonds. Instead of support, my enthusiasm was met with skepticism and whispers behind my back, leading to the belief that I was trying to impose my ideas on others. As a result, I've seriously considered quitting the HOA altogether, as the constant scrutiny and negativity have taken a toll on my spirit. However, the thought of stepping away fills me with guilt. I know that my resignation would likely mean the end of the social committee and the neighborhood events that have become so integral to our community. These gatherings, the annual summer barbecue, the holiday decorating contest, and the spring cleanup day have brought joy and connection to so many families, and I can't bear the idea of watching them fade away. What's even more frustrating is that no one else on the social committee seems willing to step up and take on the leadership role needed to keep these traditions alive. I've reached out, hoping to inspire others to share the workload, but the responses have been lackluster at best. Now, I'm left grappling with a difficult decision. Should I prioritize my own peace of mind and walk away from a role that has become so contentious? Or should I dig in, confront the misunderstandings, and fight for the community I care so deeply about? It's a heavy burden to bear, and I find myself torn between my own needs and the potential impact on my neighbors and the vibrant community we've built together. Just needed to vent. Thanks. This situation really highlights the challenges of serving on an HOA board. It's frustrating to see board members prioritize personal agendas over community well-being. The constant scrutiny over trivial matters, like the budget for social events, is counterproductive. Instead of fostering a supportive environment, it seems like the board is more interested in creating conflict. The original poster is trying to enhance community spirit, yet they're met with skepticism and accusations. It's disheartening when those who want to make a difference are pushed to the sidelines. This kind of behavior can drive away dedicated volunteers and ultimately harm the neighborhood. I can empathize with the original poster's frustration. It's disappointing to see how the board has devolved into a battleground of egos and petty grievances. The focus should be on building community and organizing events that bring people together. Yet it seems like some members are more interested in power plays and control. The constant questioning of the social committee's budget and decisions is not only demoralizing but also counterproductive. The social events are essential for fostering connections among neighbors, and it's disheartening to see them under threat. Moreover, the lack of participation from other board members in discussions and decisions is alarming. If they're not even reading the packets, how can they contribute meaningfully? The original poster is in a tough position, balancing their desire to serve the community with the negativity surrounding them. It might be worth considering gathering support from other residents who value these events. A united front could help push back against the negativity and remind the board of its primary purpose, to serve the community. This story perfectly encapsulates the challenges faced by those who volunteer for HOA boards. It's disheartening to see how quickly a group can devolve into infighting and power struggles, especially when the original intent was to foster community spirit. The original poster joined the board with good intentions, aiming to keep the social committee alive, but instead found themselves in a toxic environment. The accusations and constant scrutiny over minor details, like the budget for events, are not only frustrating but also detrimental to community morale. What's particularly concerning is the apparent disregard for established procedures. Holding special meetings to make significant decisions undermines the democratic process that HOAs are supposed to uphold. The fact that some board members admit to not reading the materials shows a lack of commitment to their roles. This is a recipe for chaos and mismanagement. The original poster is in a tough spot torn between their passion for community building and the negativity surrounding them. It's crucial for them to document everything meticulously to protect themselves and the social committee. They might also consider rallying support from other residents who value the social events. A collective voice could help push back against the negativity and remind the board of its primary purpose, serving the community and enhancing the lives of its residents. I would like to thank you for watching the video to the end. To encourage us to make more videos, please like, subscribe, comment, as well as share. Check out this other video if you haven't already.